guys welcome to the it's more than just money movement channel if you haven't subscribed please click on the subscribe button click on the notifications bell so that you don't miss any of our upcoming interviews that we are having with phenomenal men and women that are doing amazing things in south africa and beyond and remember this part of our channel it's called the winner circle and we basically have a lot of people that are coming through as winners in different industries different different businesses and different feats that they're doing uh, be it in their personal lives or in their businesses and today we have one of my favorite favorite people in in the whole world you know mm -hmm. uh an amazing businessman has been in business for a very long time and he's got a heart for for sharing and i'm hoping that you guys are going to be benefiting from the conversation that we are going to be having today his name is Mr. Apna Mariri. He's a businessman. He's a transformational speaker. You know, he spent about seven years in the U.S. He's got a degree from UCLA. Um, Yo, stop. He's, he started a company stop. called Empower. <laughs> stop. <laughs> started yeah. a company called stop. Empower. Stop. Yeah. He's got a company called Rock Fiber. He's got mm. a company called, called uh, Oxilum Capital. Uh, uh, stop. <laughs> Prabhna, I think you can tell your story better than me. No, no, no. Perhaps thank, that's thank why you. you're saying I'm a stop. Uh, no, no. I'm <laughs> saying I'm saying stop because I, you know, you're embarrassing me. You know, uh, I've got a different philosophy in life, just in terms of you know how I operate. Yeah. You know, I tend to try and hide my things. You know. It's and, difficult uh, to hide your things yeah. when you're a public figure. Yeah, like well, yeah, I'm not sure if you're a public figure. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you saying keeping me so many uh, glowing uh, accolades, man? You know, just uh, just a boy from the township. That's it. Yeah. From, I know you're from Guatem. Actually, I'm from Limpopo. You're from Limpopo? Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm from give Lim us a bit of your story. I'm from Limpopo originally. I'm, I was born and bred in Guatem, mm -hmm. but originally I'm from Limpopo. Uh, my my father is from is from there Hamarishani. Uh, if you know Jane Fess, Jane Fess, yes, yeah, I know Jane I, Fess. I'm yes. literally about 10, 15 minutes from Jane Fess. Mm -hmm. So roots for me are everything, you know, and that's why uh, when you teach kids, you you have to appreciate uh, your roots, you know, where you come from, you know, because it got such a huge bearing on how we are shaped and how we are destined to live and to leave a legacy behind. So. Yeah, it's uh, it's one of those. Yeah, so I'm from I'm from that area uh, originally, but born and bred in the East Rand uh, to a family of uh, seven, a uh, family of nine actually. My parents and then my seven siblings. I think we are now five siblings left, and then uh, my obviously my parents uh, passed away. May God rest their souls. Yeah, may their souls uh, rest in peace. Yes, and uh, and my brother, very close, also passed away, and my sister uh, just passed away, literally about two months ago. Two months, yeah. Condolences uh, for that. So, yeah. so so yeah, you know. But the older you get, <laughs> the more these things happen. You mm. know, it's just a fact of life. And uh, but grateful to have life, and to have it more abundantly. You know, as the good book says, and. Uh, and grateful to be alive and to be living in this season and in this period. Uh, these are the best of times and the worst of times uh, that we are living in. And and I'm grateful that uh, that I live in this season. Yeah. So and then you know then I went to school. You know I went to school in in Guatemala in the township Last Door. You know that's my classy town. Mm. You know proud about it and. Uh, I don't hide the fact that I'm from Guatemala, and that's what that was my political shaping, my understanding of dynamics of community. You know, I lived uh, there in a forum house. What uh, was this? The uh, very, 60s. Very poor, yeah, in the seventies, sixties, late sixties, and um, uh, very very poor. You know, but but we never saw poverty. You know, because our parents, even though my mother was a domestic worker and my father worked as a laborer, you know, to try and raise seven kids, it was not, it was an uphill battle, you know, in mm -hmm. a four-room house, mm -hmm. those 1998 Lisi's house. So, so <clears throat> in the process, I'm not, I'm not unique, you know, I think I share the same, sent I share the same uh, fate with lots of South Africans who grew up poor. But what what is key is that you make something out of your own life, and sure. you know, and uh, 
and it was always a dream to better myself. You know, uh, I, I'm a grand, I'm a grandmother's child. You know, me, I was brought up by my grandmother, and uh, because my mother Nadikori Kishini, I said it's uh, working, slaving for for white people. You know, mm -hmm. while we lived in abject poverty. You know, and that's the disparities. That's why I'll never forget apartheid. There's a, there's a, yeah. there's a, there's something that you say. I don't know if you said it in a talk or in your book. Yeah. The first time you you were in a white person's house. Oh and yeah. You saw the difference between hey, she, how she, they she, lived she, and she. how you lived. Yeah. I was yeah. A, I Can was you a, tell us more about that? No, I was a kid. Obviously, you know, re seven could not link. So, and I'm child number seven, and obviously, a uh, mama's boy. You know, so where my mom was, I would try and get there. Mm. And because Nasibitsa got a kitchening, I would cry and try to follow her. And that for me, you know, as a little kid, the impression, because I come from a match, the space is limited. It's like, you know, so confined. It's a four-room house. We sleep in the kitchen. My sister's in the other bedroom. Uh, you know, every space is utilized, you know. Uh, and, and now my mother works in this suburb town where white people live so so one day i went obviously and when i got there i I, oh, my mind was blown to smithereens because i didn't realize that people can live in such opulence you know because he has a couple whose kids are away and they live in this house that is huge bedrooms kitchen everything is big mm. directly opposite to where i come from you know and uh, which area was this uh, this was springs springs yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 and and obviously it works on you the garden the yards how is that possible you know and i was i was a little kid man who just suck it all in you know and and my mother was working for them like night and day you know early hours in the morning we couldn't spend time with this woman and she was there slaving her, her butt off just to put bread on the table and even then they received menial payments you know monthly payments there was no uh, nothing you know that's why i can never forget apartheid and every child black child that's out there must never forget uh, where they come from because you know you just have to look at your parents your grandparents your great grandparents and i'm not saying we should uh, we should dwell in the past you know because we we have to be futuristic in our disposition and thinking but the reality of the matter is that this is why you never forget where you come from and and i and i know that had my parents been granted the opportunity to be all that they could be my life would be completely different so it would be yours yes you know absolutely uh, and um, but that's the reality of where we come from. And that's why for me, uh, I teach my kids, I tell my kids, any audience that I get to the opportunity to say, don't forget about it. Mm. You know, I know there are uh, those guys who will say, yeah, it's been 21 years or 25 years or 30 years. And da, 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 da. when are we going to blame apartheid? Yeah, man, you know, don't get me started. I'm not there. But the reality of the matter is mm. that in my socialization and my upbringing, uh, the stark contrast between how white people lived and the privileges they enjoyed and how we as black people were basically uh, confined to be drawers of wood and uh, and just the scum of the earth you know mm. and 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 i i vowed even in in my in my heart of hearts to one day uh, take my mother out of that situation you know mm. and um, and i'll never forget my 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 first jobs in the us uh, I actually did two, three jobs. Yeah, you were mm. 14 when you went to the US? No, 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 I was not 14. How old were you? I was uh, literally about, I was just, I just 10, 17. You were 17? Yeah. You went to Dr. Mulab? Uh, my friend. David. Your friend, yes. Yeah, 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 we went together. Teenagers. What yeah, are you guys teenagers. running away from? Were you running away from a party? Uh, me, oh. I was, me, I just wanted opportunities. You know, I, I'd be I'd be amiss if I tell you that I was a political figure that was running away from the country be it far from it i mm. was just a young man who was driven by a dream to better themselves and better uh, the lives of uh, of uh, of uh, of my family sure and and, and where did the guts come from to be the like guts, the I'm, guts, I'm just man. taking everything i have I, sometimes which was I, what a some, backpack a uh, backpack <laughs> <laughs> To a country that I didn't even know. Yes, and I'm going yeah. overseas. I'm going it overseas. It was unheard of. Unheard of. Uh, I'd, I'd not even been to Tibet. 
for that well I've been with my father on a bus but I'd not been in a plane before and, it was the uh, first time you went to, on a plane you went to the US ever, out ever, of the country ever, going to seek ever. opportunity yeah seek opportunities the land of the the, well, the home, brave and, home of the the land of the free and home of the brave yeah yeah and, uh, <laughs> but I, I love the US you know I actually loved it I yeah. loved every bit of it was it know. easy when you got there you I got was, to the US man nothing was easy man you yeah know, so I you was, bought the plane you arrive in the US for arrive the first in the time. US uh, there we are with David you know we arrived at a place called Los Angeles mm. you know and uh, what a city LA you know? yeah LA you know we had no money uh, I, I remember you know there's a there's a there's a he's a friend now and he's a brother he's incredible I love his family you know uh, Tim Gubeni mm. I'll never forget him and but Tim I heard about him because he comes from my township. So we knew that there was a Tim Gubeni in LA. So we wanted to track and trace him. And obviously our first introduction to America was just, we couldn't find him, you know, and um, <laughs> we slept, uh, we slept uh, at, a, at a place called, we knew that he worked at a place called UCLA. Mm. And they dropped us right there and looked everywhere, couldn't, and eventually had to take, uh, there was a place called Flosham Shoe Store in Westwood. Westwood, yeah. I'll never forget it. Right at the corner, Flosham Shoe Store. It's Flosham, that shoe that used to be famous. In That's the, famous, in yeah. The 80s. <laughs> in, the, in the 80s, you wore it with brain to it. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Yeah. I was never a Flosham fan. Yeah, <laughs> because of that. <laughs> you know, so we slept there and uh, that bus bench was our was our paid for for the night, you know. Yeah. And there was I, I, remember, I, I forgot his name, but there was an African American guy who worked at the Flosham shoe store and he took our he took our luggage and he put us into he put it in the basement and we just kind of you know, 18 year olds, you know, hustling, you know, uh, and, uh, never once did I ever think I've made the wrong decision. Even, even under, during that hardship, uh, even under those circumstances, I knew that it can only get better. How it's going to get better, only God knows. Mm. And that's why, you know, when, when you are driven by a dream or uh, a, a desire, a hunger, an intrinsic a desire to better yourself <laughs> the word impossible does not exist mm. because there's an opportunity with your name written on it somewhere and you gotta fight tooth and nail to try and find it and in that condition that environment you know our desire obviously was me i want education i want to better myself i want to be the first one in this and that and that and that in my family and and that's what drove me yeah you is know. it the, is it at that point where you uh, then when you left there, got a job as a security guard. Yeah, I, look, we, we, we made, we, we, yeah I mean, I, I wrote extensively in my book mm. uh, because there's chronology, the chronology of events in terms of what took, because our destination ultimately was a place called Huntsville, Alabama, which is, which is another uh, story. And then uh, we, I eventually left Huntsville, came back to L.A., Mm. You know, and that's where I met, uh, you know, guy, I met a guy from Guatemala, uh, Ron Kudene, and then I met Lebo M, a tiny little Is this the Lion King times now? Uh, the, not no, yet. yo, Lion King times, far from it. We were all hustlers. <laughs> Man, I can tell yeah. you stories about Lebo, you know. Uh, Lebo was literally living in South Central, South Central LA. You know? South Central LA, what, uh, what did it look like uh, back in the day? Back in the day, yeah. yeah it was, it was, there was the crisps and the, uh, the, the bloods or something like that. Yeah, it was a gang territory. Yeah. You know. And uh, and he used to work at a place called Sisters, which was on Vermont, you know. Uh, I think, yeah, it was on Vermont. Further down, when you go all the way down, Vermont takes you either to Hollywood or it takes you to uh, literally to South Central Los Angeles. And you will end up, uh, uh, the, the John Singleton wrote a movie called, uh, I forgot the movie, he, he directed a movie. Um, <sighs> How can I forget this movie? You know, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant movie. But it was shot in Inglewood. You know, it came from, so, so that road leads you to Inglewood. And there's a place there, Olebo used to work called Sisters. And, and, and me and Ron were poor, man. We used to go there during lunchtime. And, 
Get the fuck out of here. As, excuse the French, you know, because it, 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 that's what he would say. That's what he would say because we're oh, hungry. Not, not we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I could give you food. Uh, give you food. Then we'd go there and, uh, and uh, but he was a hustler of note. I have tremendous respect for the brother. Yeah. He's done well for himself and he's a good friend of mine. An avid supporter of of what I do, you know. Sure. But at that time, you know, we're all. So it's always been a supporter of what you do, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 for sure. And we supported each other, you know, vice versa, you know. And uh, and he was a go-getter. So I met that when I went back. I met those kind of guys, you know. When you went back to LA. When I went back to LA, and of course I didn't have a job. I didn't have money, so I took a job at McDonald's. I took a job at Wendy's. I became a security guard, and I remember when I was working at Wendy's. There's a, uh, 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 and 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 I all, we all just crack about it because I I remember. Uh, uh, I was working at Wendy's, you know, uh, in to, closer towards Hollywood. And I was working with Mexicans, you know, because that area is full of Mexicans. And, and man, I'm flipping beggars. I'm hot. I'm hungry. I'm tired. I ain't got shit in my name, you know. And I was just a hustler of note. And, and, and up, up there's, a, there's a limousine that drives up the driveway. Yeah. You know, and that limousine... Uh, man, you know, because we're close to Hollywood, you know, you figure there's a lot of celebrities, celebrities that would want movie the stars. Bag and yeah. stuff like that. There's an order of a day, you know. So th- then, then my manager comes and says, I've got visitors. I said, visitors? Me? I'm thinking Ron, you know, okay. And when I get out, it was Lebo mm. and Venon. Venon, Lebo and Venon, they went together in the US, you know. And they went to a place called, they went to a school called Duke Ellington School of Music, Mm -hmm. Syracuse, New York, or something like that. And they came to LA looking for greener pastures and boom, they hit it with Warner Brothers and recorded an album. And, uh, and that day they hit a jackpot, man. You know, they're just celebrating and they came to see me. In the limousine. In the limousine, man. These brothers, I said, damn, man, these are the kind of dudes. (laughs) My boys, man. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and Venon is actually Thibaut Tachi's uncle. Yeah. Who was subsequently murdered in uh, in uh, in New York. Sure. Uh, somewhere in New York and uh, in the early 90s. Mm. Very close friend of mine. You know, incredible. But these brothers were hustlers, man. They, so they came there and, uh, you know, celebrating the album and, and stuff like that. And I think they left me a hundred dollar note at that time. <laughs> it was a lot of money. Uh, it was a lot of no- money. <laughs> that evening, I got a shock of my life that they actually got arrested. Okay. You know, because in celebration, they went to some exclusive place in Beverly Hills or somewhere there and ordered amazing food. And the manager called the police and said, there's some black dudes here who Where are flashing they money. Their money from? Where they get their money <laughs> As they were exiting, man, LAPD, Los Angeles Police Department with guns, man, drawn out. Yeah. Get your ass down. <laughs> uh, man, I can tell you stories. Stories. And, and boom. Uh, they got arrested. Yeah. They got arrested. And they went to LA County Jail. Sure. Believe it or not. And, and they were there for quite some time. So, But these are the brothers that for me impossible was not in their vocabulary and they came from south africa mm. and so you could just, relate with them. i could relate and they were ahead of me in terms of they've been there for many years and here i am coming and i'm i'm thinking limousine hollywood la black brothers i mean this is le bumurake Venon Molefe. Yeah. Apna Marir, you know, see what's up. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. So if it's possible for them, it's possible for me. So sure. they, they became a source of inspiration. Wow. A tremendous source of fast track forward. We, we eventually, you know, of course I was, you know, I, I registered at a place called Los Angeles City College where Lebo was and Ron was, and I couldn't pay my fees, so I got kicked out. 
So I had to obviously hustle other opportunities and, you know, applied to different institutions, uh, trying to get scholarships and uh, was turned down. Didn't you write to like 50, yeah, 50 in scholarships? Yeah, some ridiculous number yeah. and companies, man. 50 companies. Uh, yeah, so. yeah, it's incredible when you're in your teens and in your 20s. How and you're you, hungry. You're hungry. Mm. You know, that's what Les Brown says. You've got to be hungry. Yeah. You know, and, uh, and, and they all turned you down. All, all 50 all, plus all, of them. All, all, all turned me down. Uh, Until uh, what? Until Bratim. Oh, Bratim, yeah. Uh, uh, credit, man. Give credit where credit is due. I went to Bratim and he facilitated a scholarship for me from the United Nations. And that's how I went to UCLA, University of California at Los Angeles. So that same institution that where I there was a floor shame shoe store in front of me there was a sign where you arrived where I arrived with uh, with David uh, unbeknownst to me a couple of years later literally about two two three years later yeah. I found myself at UCLA University of California at Los Angeles studying political science and economics with a full scholarship from the United Nations but you still chose to be a security guard by day uh, by night yeah, yeah and a student I, I, by day I tell you why I chose that yeah. because you know a couple of things that was motivating me was home. Home. Yeah, yes. yeah home. Was Absolutely. my mother as a domestic worker. And I said to myself, I'd made a promise to her. I said, Mom, when I get some decent money, whatever you're pay, getting paid, I will double it. And you can leave that job. And you can leave that job and go stay in your township at home. Okay. Mm. And I was driven to do exactly that. Okay. Sure. And, uh, and I'll never forget, man. So I, I worked at Wendy's. And then uh, there's a lot of stuff that happens, you know, because uh, in my hustle, remember, I only got a scholarship three years later. So I was picked up by a lady named uh, Mrs. Bartler. Mrs. Bartler. I was yeah, getting to Mrs. She, Bartler. She just passed the away. The property mogu. She, she just passed away, uh, what, maybe three months ago. Ah, oh, man. Yeah, so I spoke at a funeral. You at the funeral? Yeah, I, was, I spoke at a funeral with uh, Maisha, uh, her daughter. Uh, Quincy uh, James. Quincy as in Quincy Jones? No, 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 not Quincy Jones. Quincy was her son. Oh, her son, okay. Yeah, and then uh, uh, James, you know. Mm. Uh, this this woman was incredible. That's your first mentor? Yeah, first in mentor. In the US? Yeah, first mentor, because, oh. because well, she picked me up and she obviously lived in a place called Altadina. Now, there's a place called Pasadena, mm. then Altadina, but it's, in, it's on the south, somewhere yeah, so south of uh, of LA, you know, so uh, south of LA. So I, I lived with her and this is the first time I experienced a woman, a black African-American woman, uneducated, mm. but who had an incredible panache for property. Mm. And, and this woman would basically look at uh, dilapidated properties and buy one. And she would basically use us to fix the property. And of course, where we couldn't, she would get people and, and by, by the time she, she concluded all her deals, she was living in, in a four and a half million dollar home in, in a place called Diamond Bar. That's almost, that's almost a hundred million rents. Uh, and I had the opportunity to go there. Sure. Yeah. Mrs. Butler. Wow. You know, so she, she obviously, you know, I, I used to, she was a hardcore Christian, you know. And she would take me to, uh, uh, to, to, to places where the likes of uh, got exp exposure to American preachers like Kenneth Copeland, like Jerry Savelle. Uh, like Is that where you, you met uh, Fred Price? Mel Jones's? No, 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 no. This, is, this was my hustling days, bro. Mm. You know, I was nothing. So I couldn't even meet them. I was just in a crowd. You're talking five six thousand people and mrs butler said let's go and we go we sit there we get a seat somewhere you know mm. uh, it was only when i came home that when i did my tracks back to the u.s i got a chance to meet the likes of noel jones bishop kenneth alma yeah quite a bit paul morton so it's people that you used to see on stage yeah, on stage. Now, as part of the 6,000. Yeah, now you were 6, meeting yeah. face to face. Yeah, having coffee, teas and them, them. Tell me about the time you graduated from UCLA. Yeah, you know, fast track. Obviously, I get a scholarship from Ratim and I'm hustling and driven. Just to answer your question, I was driven by sending money home to get my mother off. 
so she can go back and enjoy her the rest of her days. Mm. And when that phone call I picked up, uh, there was that apartheid uh, killer who was killing people. I forgot my my sailor or something like that. Mm. She had frequented my house a couple of times looking for me. So my parents didn't want me to call home. So I called home. My sailor was looking to kill you. Yeah, I I'd left. So the, the, it's incredible how the apartheid machinery worked, man, because. And I actually got a couple of years ago, that's when, when we were talking about it. And that's what they, they would tell me that this, you know, after you left, uh, we got these visitors that used to come uh, from the apartheid police and, and stuff like that. I'm not a political animal. I didn't go for political reasons. But the fact remains that I left, left the country. Yeah. And they, they equated all the people who left as obviously political exiles who wanted to subvert government and, yeah, and overthrow government so 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 uh, they would frequent so i called my mom i called in and i called and it wasn't on a cell phone because there were no cell phones at the time it was a landline mm. call my mother and said hey mom uh, i think you can retire what i did actually i first sent the money just yeah. proof is that when you were now a security guard yeah security guard in, in working so i sent the money you're earning dollars pay. Uh, dollars <laughs> hey bro hey bro hey bro hey bro yeah america was not glowing you know for most of us and mm. i know the narrative that says if you're in america everything is good you're living your life man we lived in one bedroom apartment you know nine of us Majid. with one chair yeah and fridge and with your food marked you know and uh, and we used to buy chickens at a there's a venice boulevard when you go towards uh, the beach there's a place the mexicans i don't know where they got those chickens because they sold those chickens for 39 cents a full chicken mm. and that's where we use man talk about any place where they offered cheap that's where i was i could find bargains anywhere Mm. My shoes, I, I, I didn't spend more than $15 for shoes. Yeah. I buy, if I find something $11, I buy all the pairs that I can find. Different colors? Uh, different, same color. I don't care. <laughs> it's your problem to think that I wear the same shoe. Yeah. <laughs> Even today, you know, my wife, my wife tells, says to me, hey, 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 what say warning me? Hey, what I'm not wearing it for people. Yeah, it from I'm back comfortable, in the days. man. I'm comfortable. So if you see me in a suit today, tomorrow, yeah. the next day, it's your problem. It's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> I had a mission, man, and my mission was just uh, buy cheap. Yeah. <laughs> and if you can find five of them, take cool. all of them. Take all of them. Same color. <laughs> Same shoe. <laughs> Same shoe. <laughs> Just cheap. So I can wear it today, tomorrow. Whether you say, hey, it's your problem. It's not my problem. Your problem. Yeah. So I used to buy cheap. The, the purpose was to save as much no, money as you save can. As much take money. it back I, home. I, I didn't like that. I didn't like uh, owing people. Even now, you don't like it? No, 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 I don't. I don't like debts. I don't like owing people. I don't like. I just like a simple life, man. I want to have money tomorrow. If I decide I'm going to New York, uh, buy a ticket and get out. If mm. I want to uh, take my family out to a nice meal, I'm not going to count my cents and say, hey, we're under budget. I want to do it. Mm. But that comes with a culture of That's training. That's a proper philosophy, right? It comes with a culture of training yourself to say, you know what? One of the things that, and I'm grateful that God gave me that, I have no spirit of comparison whatsoever with anything, with anyone. Mm. I live on my own mm. lane. That I can attest to. I've seen I you live, around billionaires. And I live on my own yourself. lane, man. You know, I, I, I drive my parky and park it next to Rolls Royces with the greatest of ease. And still congratulate the people. The fact that they are in my atmosphere, in my environment, in yeah. my sphere, yeah. you know, is, is enough for me to say... I'm okay. Yeah, but don't you think it's because you've got influence? The I don't fact that you can, you've got influence even in that sphere. Yeah, look, I I I call it maybe maybe my socialization is slightly different because I call I call it favor. Favor. Not not influence. Sure. You know? Sure. I, I believe sometimes favor is not fair. You know, God can favor you 
and put you in places that will shock you yourself that you never thought you could be. Mm. You know, mm. and sometimes you pinch yourself and say, hey, "I'm here, and I'm not here as a second-class citizen. I'm here at the top, on the table." It was the favor of God. Treated as an equal. It's a favor of God. Sure, but what? Sure. But equally, I can go to uh, back to my hood and and still be myself. No distinction, no difference, nothing. You know, I used to work for, I used to work for Billy Graham. Mm-hmm. And there was a guy who worked for Billy Graham. I'll never forget it. He was the, he was like the chief executive of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. So when Franklin Graham came to South Africa to do ministry, mm. <clears throat> I was I was requested to to assist and to, to to do that. But this guy tells a story. He said he traveled with Billy Graham to go and meet the president, and. Um, and on his way back, he was sitting in business class, in, in business class, and he's first class, and he sat next to a guy who was crippled, you know, and 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 this guy was crippled from waist down, and he soiled himself, and so this guy started to weep, but he was sitting next to him. Now, obviously, conversation took place, and eventually, the guy disclosed in terms of what transpired and what happened. And he said, uh, right there and then, he knew what he needed to do was to take this stranger and clean him in first class. Mm. Take him to the loo, clean him, dress him properly and bring him back. From an audience with the president to cleaning a person. Mm. So God can expose you to opulence. But don't take the opulence in your head. It can equally take you to conditions that are completely deplorable. The question is, what kind of breed are you? So me, like Paul, I want to fit in any environment. <clears throat> Pick so up all things to all men. I'm happy to go to uh, <clears throat> a township in my township. Yeah. And a funeral. And or, or, or mine, where you or met me. Yeah, or when, when I was yeah, still a boy. Yeah, and there's a funeral. I'm going to join the queue. Yeah. And do exactly the same. I'm going to go back to the house and stand in the queue like everybody and get a foil and eat. Mm. Because it is well. So I'm happy with that, you know. So when I, I'm not moved, uh, how do I put it? I'm not moved by... All of us like material things. Don't get me wrong. We live in a capitalist environment, and I'd be, I'd be failing in my duty to say subject yourself because uh, to a life of poverty or life of uh, no, no, no. Good things, nice things are beautiful, and and we all want them, mm-hmm. you know. But not at the expense of of pleasing your next door neighbor while you are struggling to make ends meet. That for me is a mismatch. And I don't even know how we got to this topic. And the, uh, oh, you're flowing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. So, so yeah, it, uh, you know, so I, I had to take my mother off, uh, off the, off the grid as an, as a, as a, as a laborer, mm. you know, uh, working. So she retired as soon as you started yes. making money as a security guard. I send the money first. And I said, How much no. did you send? Then? No, it wasn't a lot. I mean, at the time, I, I think at the time, uh, they were being paid menial amounts. You know, maybe fifty uh, bucks. Yeah, maybe, um, uh, slightly more. Maybe, maybe a thousand or or eight hundred rands a month or something like that. If my memory serves me well, mm. so I said I'll double it for her. So I doubled it for her consistently. So mm. for me, first port of call is my tithe. Second port of call is sending money to my mom. You know, and standard. making sure standard, and mm-hmm. of course, you know, add a little more to make sure that their home, their lives are much better. Mm. Okay, uh, so so that's what I did. And, and you were not even the eldest at the time. Hmm? You were not even the eldest at the time, but the ah, desire last, last born, last born, yeah. last born, last but born. the desire was so strong then. Was, uh, was driven. It was so strong, incredibly strong. Fortunately, my parents brought up kids, and the, and provided a home where. We got along. 
Mm. We're tight as a f- we had our issues, no doubt. Just like anybody, not not a perfect family. We had our issues, but we were strong. We looked, out for, strength. we looked out for each other. Yeah. So if you're in school, we're gonna chip in to make sure that you're comfortable. All of us. Mm. Good sense of unity. Yeah, right? good sense of unity. So so I I was I was brought up with that, and I loved my parents. My father, you know, I come from a. a, a you know, I, I I later found out in many years that my father was a rejected son. So his father literally rejected him. Mm-hmm. You know, his father uh, impregnated my can, my grandmother, and Rabbi Samulatu, the guy said no. So Mariri is really not my last name. So my grandmother met another guy who's Mariri. Mariri took responsibility. Mariri, Mariri took responsibility <clears throat> for my dad mm. and brought my dad to such levels that we didn't know that Mariri was not our father. Mm. Biologically. You know, in other words, the surname was not really, we were something else. But the manner in which my my dad's father loved him it was shocking and the entire family so when i say i'm going home i'm not going i'm going ramariri i'm mariri through and through and the love is there and it's strong too much my cousins they, we're huge what but that's a subject where when you deal with uh, fatherlessness you know the issues of men that's where i'm passionate about that's where it comes from mm. because of of what we experienced you know so i got my mother out of that setup that situation and uh, my dad was an introvert uh, quiet you know when when you're in active addiction they said you know the disease of addiction is <clears throat> is hereditary mm. is uh, is is fatal and uh, something else i forgot you know there's mm-hmm. three things that, yeah it's hereditary and and it's fatal but there's something else that, so so when i trek because my father never used to drink a lot you know so when i trekked and traced my own genealogy to try and find out where does this addiction i didn't blame anyone mm. i blame myself for for being an addict but that's a subject for another day. We'll get into it. Oh, well. we'll, I, I want you, we're going to get into it. <laughs> hey, man. I, I uh, want you to first tell me uh, about uh, about the day you graduated. Uh, from because school? Now, yeah. Okay. That day. Remember? remember Graduated from where? From UCLA. From, from, oh, and, UCLA. And then we're going ah, we're gonna to move into yeah, when man. you came to SA yeah. and started being a speaker, doing amazing things, yeah, and yeah, you get yeah, into yeah, the yeah. genuine addiction. But yeah, look. <laughs> look, you know... There was no one there. Pele, your family was not there when you graduated. No, no. only Miss Butler and Ms. Quincy Butler. and Malisha and, and the kids. They came. And you were wearing a suit. Was it for the first time you were? Oh, suit? you read it in my book. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man. Just tell the story. Dude. <laughs> Leave me alone, man. <laughs> you know. No, man. It was, uh, it was fascinating, you know. Uh, my goodness. You know, I spent three years out of school, three years, three solid years hustling on the streets of L.A. Mm. And uh, now I get this opportunity to go to UCLA, funded by the United Nations. And and I go and I study. (laughs) Okay, in that hustle, I also got married, you know, to an African-American woman named renee from richmond kentucky mm. and uh, and unfortunately our marriage didn't work okay but that's how so I, me and you have something in common oh <laughs> hey dude didn't i see something on facebook i meant to read it i'm gonna go back man. Yeah, man. and i know a lot about that yeah eh? Because I know your ex. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I don't know your ex. Nah, you don't know my but ex. I know your wife. Uh, so you know my wife. <laughs> it's good, man. I know your ex. I was there. I was at your wedding. You were my MC. Yeah, I was your MC. <laughs> yeah, 
Dude, you owe me a lot of money. I do, I do. I do. You owe me a but lot you said money. you were doing it for her. Oh. So she owes you. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Even though I said it. <laughs> but you are supposed to pay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Damn, dude. I've done a lot for your ass. Yeah. <laughs> I need royalties. Ah, yeah, you'll get them. Eh, 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 eh. It's more than money. <laughs> eh, 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 eh. You know, you know this guy. You know, I even call. I even hooked up with the, somebody to do a workbook. Yes. Hey, yeah, for the workbook. I for told him book. after he wrote, I said, "Man, do a workbook. Go on a tour. Come on, man. Come on. Why didn't you in the northwest or something like that on your tour? Uh, the when this month? I don't know. We were. What were we? Uh, no, when when Jobek this month, last month when Limpopo, uh, I need to come and tell the story and say, man, I'm the I'm the brain behind it, <laughs> <laughs> the tours and, and all that. Because I said, man, get on a tour. It's called know? mentorship. Yeah, okay, get Mrs. on a tour. Mrs. Butler I said, told you I for, said, for put a, a workbook. Put a workbook around the book because your book is thick. Put a workbook. Yeah. And go on a tour. Yeah. And uh, I did. I listened. And I was an MC at your wedding. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what else didn't I do? <laughs> Yeah, and you mentored me in my early yeah. days in business. Yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah, hey, man, you you were not as as uh, as uh, as thick when you were going through divorce. I was. I, I was. I met, I met you at Capelli. <laughs> I even thought maybe I should bring a. I'm like, I found a friend. I said, man, I think witness is on track. That <laughs> guy is too thin. And you know when uh, people are on drugs, you can tell. You I know when you tell, man. A couple of months ago, you were like, <laughs> the only thing that will accelerate weight loss that quickly is crack cocaine. Crack cocaine. Yeah, I'm like, hmm. She on crack? <laughs> I listen to you. Yeah. And we had cafe, no, man, in Boxberg. Yeah. Hey, and we sat down there. Yeah, I was narrating the story. Uh, you know, narrating the story, what happened, and... <laughs> You've been through. You've been through a lot, man. I, I remember yeah. some. I won't mention names, but you went to Durban. Yeah. And spent Christmas and New Year alone. <laughs> <laughs> Is this interview about me or about you? <laughs> it doesn't matter, man. Are you such I, can I can tell you now. <laughs> I gotta file this pig on you. <laughs> Yeah, I spent it alone. Huh? I spent Christmas alone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hey, you were thin, man. <laughs> Skeleton. <laughs> Bones. Black <laughs> man. Hmm. She witness on drugs. Yeah. So you graduated. And then you came <laughs> from drugs. <laughs> hey, look at the clever guy. <laughs> Trying to, <laughs> ah, you can never fool me, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you married this African American. Yeah, woman. I graduated. Yeah. It's good to graduate. <laughs> <laughs> Did you marry her before you graduated? Uh, I graduated. <laughs> <laughs> me, I graduated. I plead the fifth. You yeah. know. <laughs> I graduated from UCLA, man, and uh, yeah, yeah, th that day, man, the only people I could invite, because my parents were that far away, mm. you know, and I had hustled, man, I had hustled, you know, but the beauty of it, uh, witness, is that I'd broken the cycle in my family, because I was the first one. The to first one to graduate. From an institution of higher learning. Mm. I was mm. the first, first, first one to graduate. And I graduated and I finished and Miss Butler was there. Of course, man, you know, you all look uniformed, you know, you're wearing your gowns, it's cool. My boys, my classmates, most of my classmates were, you know, my boys were African-Americans, you know? Sure. So, and, you know, quite a lot of them, you know? So we graduated, you know, I'd, I'd formed, actually I'd formed on my graduation day, you know, they've got a huge graduation and then they've got a, a black version of graduates, you know? Mm. Uh, at the time, I had a, a musical group with uh, Bulebu and Ron called Temba. Temba. Yeah. yeah Is yeah. that where Nancy Ngonyama it, you it, it, started? Yeah. It, that Nancy Ngonyama, uh, well, I carry we're hustling. Mm. You know, so, Guys, I'm plugging you, Labona. <clears throat> 
Uh, you know, we're hustling, so we started a musical group called Temba. I'll, I'll never forget. So uh, I did marketing, you know. Oh, for the group? For the group. After graduating? No, no. Be, Before? Uh, it was part of the hustle, you know. Yeah. Yeah, so because in that three years, one of the things that we did was to, we were trying to go to school. Ron had a scholarship. I didn't. Lebu didn't have a scholarship. And da 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 da. So musical group, Temba, let's go and sing South African songs and stuff like that. You must know Americans, Americans, when it comes to South African music, you know, what you, what you would detest here, like, you know, I mean, Maotela Queens, mm -hmm. you know. But when, they love it. There's a place in UCLA called Royce Hall. It's very exclusive. It brings uh, some of the top names. You know, uh, I was there. I physically was there when they said my hotel Queens is coming to Royce Hall. Mm. And these guys packed it out. They had to extend the days because so, of the demand. That's the music. Americans liked it. Lady spent Black Mambazo. Mm. Uh, uh, Miriam Makeba. Miriam Makeba. I, I met Huma Sikela. Brahu, I know. I, I, I we'll talk Brahu. about Brahu I met later. Brahu. I met... Uh, they didn't Brahu, Brahu drag you to rehab? Yeah, he dragged when me. When you were in He dragged me to rehab, bro. Mm. Yeah, Brahu. You see, bro, I wish Brahu was alive because he would have been my main speaker at my, at my book launch. Sure. And uh, because that guy, man, that guy I take my head off of. He he was my avid support. I work exclusive, extensively with him, you know. And uh, uh, we toured, we traveled, you know, in LA, locally, you know, the late Tepotola, you know, uh, because Bra Brahu had an organization called MAPSA, mm. you know, that was driving an agenda to help musicians who were stuck in trucks. And drug addiction you know <clears throat> so i knew he was passionate about it and at the time there's a church i used to attend in daviton you know yeah so i'd, I'd, I'd do a drug awareness day and i wasn't even taking drugs at the time man well, it was before no it was before and and you know and i'd bring brahu he'd talk and and when he did his concert for fundraising i'd bring a group of people that uh carnival city and uh you know then we had trained the train man i worked extensive social development you know uh, and met cabello mabalane you know you know you know but long time ago with level and them met chico twala and in new york i met Duman Lovu. Mm. you know Duma was at the time was rattling the cage in new york and it was doing all kinds of amazing things, bringing ball power, uh, bringing, uh, you know, working very closely with Mbongeni Gema, bringing ball power, Sarafina, Asna Mali, you know, all kinds of shows that were happening at the time, you know, and uh, it was exciting times, you know, so I graduate, I finish, and I come home, and, uh, and yeah, man, it was exciting times, but that graduation for me was, was, was something, uh, broke something, you know. Mm. It, so um, you paved the way for everyone else. I don't want to say a generational curse, but it broke something. I, I saw that. Yeah. That's yeah. why I didn't yes, finish yes, the yes, statement. Yes, 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 yeah. Yeah. So you get home, and then... I get home and... When uh, did you discover now that you're a speaker? Because you got home... No, I got but home... You, but you were doing a lot of tours as a uh, speaker. No, no, no. You are in demand. Yeah, I, look, you know, I've always liked standing in front of an audience and speak. You know, I mean, in LA, you know, when I was at UCLA, at UCLA, because I belong to an African student union, uh, that's where we brought Louis Farrakhan, met Louis Farrakhan. Uh, we brought... Uh, uh, we brought Jesse Jackson. Mm. You know, I met Jesse. In fact, Jesse Jackson used to have a black guy from South Africa working for him in his organization when he was running for president of America. Mm. You know, and, uh, you know, brought in the uh, first time I, I met, I, I picked up Chris Honey, the late, God rest his soul, at the airport to come and speak at UCLA. You, sp you picked him up? I picked him up. Wow. You know. So that, that platform of African Student Union opened a world for me, 
and and incredible. I mean, there's all kinds of groups, man. All kinds of groups. Paul Simon, when after he came from South Africa uh, with his album, you know, we we brought him to UCLA. You know, uh, not only as a speaker but as a musician and things like. That. And I was still at varsity. Mm. You know, and and what I discovered about America is that when you're a musician or a backup artist, it pays a lot. You know. So we then, you know, as, 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 as a band, you know, Temba, you know, we then, we then did all kinds of things, you know, when uh, the late uh, comrade Oliver Tambo came, you know, he spoke at an AME church, you know, mm. I, I went and spoke at the pastor and said, look, man, there's this brilliant South African musical group, you know, can they sing? They said, yeah, no, they can come and sing. So we sang, I met Oliver Tambo, we met Oliver Tambo, the late. You know, mm. and and that's how, uh, you know, the in its smallest form, that's how the group. Of course, Lebo was a musician, and you know, and uh, and I know we went to do uh, backup vocals for Jonas Kwangwa, for uh, Bruce Springsteen. Uh, pff, yeah, man, we did quite a bit, you know, and uh, and uh, and yeah, Lebo branched out and did the Lion King, you know. Mm. <laughs> You know, stuff like that. I still get royalties from Yeah, that. your name is there. Mm. And I still get royalties. You get paid. I get paid, yeah. Yeah, I get, you've I got still, passive income. I, I worked, Forever. I also worked for, for you know, Bill Cosby had an offshoot show called A Different World, yeah. which, which was produced and directed by a lady named, uh, how can I forget, Debbie Allen, mm. you know? So I remember I went to audition. You know, and when Bishop Tutu, you know, we went for an, we went, Is it your voice or Nancy Ngoyam? Uh, when Bishop Tutu, <laughs> when when Bishop Tutu, yeah. it's Lebo's voice. It's when, Lebo's voice. When Bishop Tutu, uh, when Bishop Tutu came to the US, you know, we were we brought him to the US. We created an organization that brought him to the US, and uh, he he came. And that organization that I worked for, it had one writer. Who was writing for a show called Family Matters? I remember Family Matters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and Steve I, Urkel. Uh, Steve Urkel, and I yeah. went, I went, I went to the guy. I said, "Man, there's there's this opportunity for an African to be on a show uh, called A Different World, you know." So he has a script. So we rehearsed the script, rehearsed the script. There must have been at least over 500 Africans who were auditioning for that, mm -hmm. uh, and I got the role. Yeah, uh, I got the role, and and I was on a different world. I still get royalties from that, mm. you know, which was an offshoot show of Bill Cosby. And, uh, yeah, and, and, and that group Temba exposed us. And for me, it was just a hustle to get money to send home. And that's it. And you didn't know that it's opening up you know, a different country, world for you. It's opening up a different world, you know, being out there. You know, that's why the scripture said, cast your prayed upon the waters because in many ways, in many forms. Is that why you said I must go on tour? Yeah, that's why I say go on tour. You be, were, be, be out there. You, be were, there were, you were hesitant. You know. Mm. It's, it's more than money. Come up with a workbook. You can set a book and a workbook and when you get on tour, you can... Because that's what I did when I, uh, when I left Active Addiction. I designed a workbook with uh, Kirsten Alexander. Mm. Designed a workbook and that workbook is Choose Life. It's animated, it's got stories and stuff like that. So when I talk about addiction, I sell you my workbook and we go through the workbook. Yeah, but, but they don't know that how you got into addiction, you were at a party after a speaking gig. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so when yeah, I came Stay away home, from women. Because huh? cause I get the women, you were supposed to go Who, who are you telling to stay away from women? <laughs> the crowd, the audience. Ah, yeah. We should say me and you should stay away from women. Oh, we must stay away. <laughs> <laughs> we are staying away, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but, but you know, I mean, no, no, no. So, you got so, back, ne? No, I got back. And in coming back, obviously, you know, it's, it's a, hey, I have to get a job and work. I did get. And you're not used to jobs. You're no, used to hustling. I'm, less, I'm used to hustling, man. So, so, you know, one one thing about being a hustler in LA, it's, it's amazing how everything works together for good. Because when I was shopping for clothes, cheap clothes, when I was in America for myself, because my budget was limited, mm. I was then exposed to different places that were selling and manufacturing clothing. You know, 
Mm. I was exposed. I'd go to fashion shows and I'd check out fashion shows. And I only learned then that on the day, the last day of the fashion show, nine out of 10 times, everybody who comes to showcase their wares, they want to sell them cheap because they don't want to return with boxes. Mm. So mm. something that was selling for $200, maybe you get it for $20. So I'd wait for fashion shows to end. And that's how, when I came home. You were selling clothes. I was selling clothes. And I knew exactly where to buy clothes. Cheap clothes. Would you go overseas to I buy? Would or, go, I would, or you would go? Six, seven times. And I'd go specifically to LA. I didn't go to <coughs> Turkey, China, because I didn't know those places. I knew, you knew where you were. Uh, man, I would sell colognes, you know. I mean, your Tom Ford's, you know. I know where to get. That's why you still love Tom Ford. Uh, even inexpensive now. Tom Ford. I would, you know, jewelry, you know, jewelry, uh, watches, uh, you name it, timepieces. I, I knew exactly where to get them. And I knew as well that me, I don't want to make ridiculous profit. So I'm not going to, I don't have a store. My store is my home. Mm. So, so I don't have You're overheads. In Guatemala. I was in Guatemala at my mother's house. <clears throat> so I don't have overheads. So the only overhead I have is is transportation flights to the us and coming back so if i bought something for i give you example if i bought suits i used to bring suits so i buy a suit for uh, maybe wholesale i buy it for 50 dollars <clears throat> i just ate a markup of 20 20 dollars so i buy it i said it for 70 dollars mm. so what happens is that my clothing they moved quickly so I wasn't going to make maximum profits out of you and compete with Sentin yeah. while I was in a township. Sentin, they've got to pay uh, people, stores, rent, and all that. I don't think, so they have to add it on their, on their costs. Yes. No, I don't have to add it. All I have to do is just turn 20. Mm. And that's all. So I used to sell that. And I went into that business, uh, sold clothes. That's how I bought my first car. My, uh, that's how I built my house. Mm. I bought land. Uh, bought land, built my house, <clears throat> and that was it. I built my house in four ways when I got married. That was from from the selling of clothes, selling of clothes, selling of clothes, and then of course a combination of speaking engagements. You know, I was I, I went to volunteer to speak at uh, I think it was SAPC at the time, and and somebody was had a contract there to speak, so they brought me for 10, 15 minutes. And there was a lady in that audience who said, look, man, I'd like to market your services. Can I see you? So I made an appointment with her and she told me they need a young, black, vibrant speaker. Can I speak on this topic? I'm like, yeah, I couldn't. So I First you're volunteering. I volunteer, to pay you. They have to pay me, you know. So I went and spoke. My first gig was Metro Cash and Care. You're speaking to their staff. We are speaking to their staff. You know? mm -hmm. So the general manager liked me and said, no man, why don't you speak at all met Metro Cash and Care? I, 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 then I, I was shocked that this thing is money. So then I went back to my archives, to my books and started to research and hone my craft to make sure that I was the best in the game. Mm. And that's how, that's how I entered the speaking engagement. But after a while, I think I got sick for about a month or so and I missed two, three engagements. And I realized that this business, if you're not working, you're not eating. So from there, I graduated. I started a consulting company and I roped in a guy named Craig Wilkinson. And then I roped in Cesar Mulebati and Empower Consulting started. Mm. So we then offered longer courses, you know, and uh, uh, Foshini Group was our first client. I remember I was at Ruby's because I was living in four ways. I was at Ruby's with Craig Wilkinson. I said, Craig, man, we need to start a business. And we said, yeah, let's craft it and empower consulting and stuff like that. I phoned a lady. I said, man, this is what I, these are the services I can offer you and stuff like that. And she signed us up while we were at Ruby's on a Saturday. Same day. Same day, Foshini. And we went. And from there, I had a team. So Craig would be at Foshini, <coughs> I'd be at maybe Arthur Anderson and Caesar would be somewhere else and would bring in the money and I saw an opportunity there. And that's how, again, I fast forward, that's how I met Chris Fesser because I was speaking at APSA. Is that your mentor? Yeah, your I, was speaking, I was speaking at APSA and this lady who is married to Chris or somehow, you know, they had a problem at the manufacturing plant. 
you know. And the lady said, I just had a brilliant speaker. Maybe she would bring him in. So I got a call. They said, no, man, uh, Chris, uh, Chris, I went to see him. Uh, he's got these problems and stuff like that. I said, no, we'll do an assessment and diagnosis and, and find that and come up with it within 20. And that's how my relationship with Chris started. And when the writing was on the wall that it was no longer affirmative action because the country was going through affirmative action, it was now PEE, Black Economic Empowerment, uh, that, you know, especially with state-owned enterprises that you have to, you have to, you have to, uh, you, you have to give a share to previously disadvantaged individuals for you to get, continue to get contracts. At the time, at Transnet, uh, Mafigam Kwanazi was the chairman, and uh, Chris Fesser, they were supplying concrete sleepers and uh, concrete sleepers. They were supplying pipes, concrete pipes, a whole range of products because Avenge at the time was Greenacre LTA. It has various products. And when I met Chris, it was a Duraset and Infraset. Avenge your business, your company? No, Avenge their company. Oh, their yeah, company. Yeah, yeah. So <coughs> they changed from Greenacre LTA to Avenge Manufacturing. When Tiso Group took a stake in that business, it went through a serious transformation, you know, so, but early days, you know, when, when I came in with the consult, it's amazing how one thing leads to another. I, I was a speaker, introduced, started Empower Consulting, from Empower Consulting, we started something called Empower Investments. I told my guys, I said, guys, the writing is on the wall, we need to look at opportunities where we can acquire a stake. And one of those opportunities to acquire a stake uh, was Avenge Manufacturing, at the time, Greenica LTA, and Chris brought us in. So Mafigam Kwanaz at Transnet says we want transformation, you know, and we were at the door of transformation, and mm. we were ready to pounce. And through Chris Fesser says, no, I know just the right outfit to, 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 to pilot a project on, on B. And uh, the concrete sleeper business, you know, we took 50% of the shares on that. Mm. And know. people don't know you even went to the R ah, <coughs> yeah, to go to, stay there. To, understand, to the value. understand the business. You have to, because you have to understand the value chain of what it takes to manufacture a concrete sleeper. Mm. You know, at the time we're armchair investors. So you're depending on other people to make money. So it, it comes with a, a trial and error, you know. And then from there, you know, that business, uh, we worked, we paid the price. And I'm, my, my next book. How much did they give you there? Seven uh, million? Uh, yeah, it's something like that. So, 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 so we, we paid. No, we, we raised nine million. Nine million. Yeah, yeah. To, to buy a stake, you know. And, uh, you know, and, and obviously, you know, worked hard to pay for and it. And back from, then it was a lot. <clears throat> yeah, back then it was a lot. And paid, worked hard to pay, to pay, to, to pay through dividends, you know, uh, our loan back. And, and of course, that deal led to another deal, you know, where we bought uh, shares at uh, uh, Rock Fiber, mm -hmm. which manufacture industrial insulation material, you know, so we bought a stake there. Uh, uh, nothing given on a hand and on a, on a plot. And we, we had to work with the bank, man. And, 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 my, and then we went, <clears throat> when we exited uh, Avenge Manufacturing, we then uh, got some bad advice to buy a business uh, from Germans, a true fan, uh, and sunk our money and uh, took surety ships and, you know, uh, and uh, a business that was turning over 40 bar you know, eventually went into business rescue and subsequently was liquidated, mm. you know, and practically lost everything. But before then, <coughs> I want to mm. ask you something. Mm. Then around the time of doing the BE deals, mm. um, as we wrap up, you you become a millionaire and you're 34. It's rocker, First yeah. million in the bank and then now yeah. you're also um, you a know, wanted speaker everywhere. Yeah, exactly. And and you attend the party in Santin. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, my life was incredibly busy. I'm, I'm a I'm an avid church goer. I work in ministry. Um, uh, things were going very smooth on all areas of all, life. All, all good areas family. Good family. I just don't know. You know, I, my my brother had a small little boy who I adopted, because when I came back from the US, my brother and I, very close, my late brother, very close, extremely close. So when I left, I said, I'll bring you with me when I get settled. But of course, they, they, they blocked him when his passport was stamped, so he couldn't leave the country. Oh. 
<clears throat> so we got frustrated. He ended up being a laborer. So when I came back, I you know, started a transportation business, you know, a logistics business, and uh, and I brought him in. And uh, uh, unfortunately, so so he had a small little boy. So I asked him if I can take the boy. So I took the boy, adopted him. He stayed with me, and when he was seventeen, went to school. And uh, first year university, he was killed. Spusiso, spusiso, mm, mm. is in my book. <clears throat> so it was a difficult period in my life. And at the time, money was flowing, everything was going good, and I started to think that I've arrived. And I started to see flames. Uh, I couldn't cope, didn't have coping mechanism, never talked to a shrink in my life before, never sat and poured out my heart about my emotions, about how I feel. You know, men don't cry type setup, you know. <clears throat> so, yeah, and I was at the wrong place at the wrong time. My speaking engagement was flourishing. Chief was flourish, just on my speaking engagements. Mm -hmm. You know, I was making hundreds of thousands of friends, and and I say it with humility, but I was. I had an agent. I had people looking for me everywhere. I was getting paid, literally getting paid. You know, and uh, you know, fast forward. You know, wrong friends started drinking alcohol. You know. So when cataclysmic events takes place, they find me vulnerable to further go into the abyss. And I basically spiraled into a life of uh, alcohol consumption, not copious amounts of, I wasn't an alcoholic. I was a casual drinker. Yeah, like most South Africans are, mm -hmm. who I think they're on the border of alcoholism. But they're in denial, you know. And uh, when I was at the wrong place at the wrong time, I'd gone to speak and I got offered, it's in my book, I got offered something I shouldn't have taken, which was crack cocaine. Then at the first time, nobody goes into addiction or into drugs thinking that they'll become a drug addict. Everybody thinks that they've got this will and this power to control it. And, um, and I should know better. Because I worked with you, I've seen artists, I've seen people uh, who we have referred to rehabs, people that have driven to rehabs confidentially to get their lives in order. I've seen it. I lived in, with Mrs. Butler and, and one of the kids was an addict, so I know what it took. So, but there, there I was, you know, finding myself <sighs> having, having found a drug that... That was amazing. I mean, crack cocaine, my goodness. Uh, yeah, the first time I took it, it was like I saw stars, man. It's like it was raining sugar in my head. In my Weren't brain. you on the N17 when it kicked no, in? No, it was on the M1. When M1. It came, uh, on the going M1, home. Going home. And it kicked in. And I made a U10 and went back. And uh, a clandestine life was born. Mm. I became a junkie in denial. You know, I had a, I had a student, I, I had a master who was a stripper who taught me how to, how to do crack cocaine. The, the chick. Mm. Mm. And, uh, yeah, so I became, for two years I could control it, but after that it took, uh, I took. So were you minute. taking daily for not, two years? For two years, not daily. It was a weekend binge. You know, a weekend, yeah, yeah, maybe Friday, Saturday, but it progressively it gets worse. controllable then mm -hmm. when it's starting. It progressively gets worse. And remember also the tolerance levels. You know, mm -hmm. after a while, crack doesn't do much. I can take 3,000 rands worth of crack and maybe get some semblance of a high, you know. So eventually I have to mix crack cocaine with cocaine. Now, crack cocaine is in a, is in a solid form. It's like a peanut. And then cocaine is in a powder form. Mm. So cocaine, you snort it through your nose, crack, you take it through your pipe. Okay. Mm. So after a while, the tolerance level for both. So I need to accentuate, to accentuate the high, you need to mix stronger things. So it's, now it was, it was cocaine, it was crack, then it was crack cocaine. And then it, it, was, it was crack cocaine, it was cocaine, and then it was alcohol, crack cocaine, cocaine, all mixed. Mm. To, to get even a, a much more stronger high. 
and the and of course your body cannot handle it because eventually you don't sleep and it takes its toll and and you look for places to use drugs man I, you said i was thin through divorce how thin were you then uh, i was thinner than you <laughs> <laughs> compared to you <laughs> if there was a beauty contest i would have won <laughs> Yeah, and, and how much were you spending then at the height of the addiction? At the height of addiction, yeah. man, I was at the height of my addiction. I was doing at least, and I say it with humility. I'm mean, not here to glorify drugs, but I was doing at least three and a half, five grand a day. Five grand a day. Yeah, at the height of my addiction on crack, because a full moon at the time was three grand. Yeah, one uh, half a moon. So this thing was can finish someone's money completely. It does. Not can it does. Anybody who is something who takes crack cocaine or cocaine or drugs, their way is you can be in in a mansion in Hyde Park, copious amounts you'll end up with nothing. Mm. I know I know people. I work in the space now. Mm. I know people who. By the been, way, guys, the name of the book is called The Door. Yeah, I put the door. Three hundred and nine yeah. pages I wrote, man. I mm. discovered while writing that I'm a writer yes. through and through. Yes. So so I, I'm a writer. You're a creative. Uh, uh, man, I, I sit on a computer and write. <coughs> I've got a couple of books in me that mm. are coming out. You know? They have to. They have to. I've got fiction. I've got I've got my books on hard lessons. Yeah. Uh, it's a business book. You know, yes. things they never t t teach you. You know, in university, because I found myself, I found myself in high court. I found myself on business rescue. I found myself briefing counsel. I found myself, and this is on the business side. On the people, business side, yeah. People know me as a motivational speaker. They don't know my business side. Yeah. You know? They don't know that the uh, whole train runs on your slab. Yeah, I know. But, you know, so, so, so for me, for me, um, it's a journey, man. Mm. It's a journey. So let's say you were given an opportunity to speak to someone at home and your name is cocaine. What would you say to them? The, the, someone is watching there. My name is cocaine. Yeah, your name is cocaine. Uh, I've got a poem in my book. The, yeah, your okay. name is but, cocaine. But, but uh, uh, I, end, I wrote 309 pages. Believe me. 309 pages. I printed 2,000. I launched it last year. Mm -hmm. You know, at a friend of mine had a place called Melrose at the Melrose Arch. He had a place called uh, a Club Kilimanjaro Lebo. Uh, he had a club called Club, club yeah, Club yeah. Kilim. Him and uh, his partner CD from uh, Senegal. They had a club called Club Kilimanjaro, and now it's called the Venue. And that's where I oh, launched I my book. Vein, yeah. yeah, that's where I launched my book. I and Kilimanjaro used to kill it back in the day. Uh, back in the day, man, there was a club <laughs> within a club. Certain club. I'm not gonna mention anything about about that, but yeah, was it? You know, so so yeah, I wrote uh, 309 pages. I launched my book there, and mm. uh, and and brought uh, some of uh, some of my incredible supporters in the industry. Yeah, so I end with a poem, my book. 305 page number 305 this is my name is cocaine um, call me coke for short it's a poem i entered this country without a passport ever since then i made lots of scam rich some have been murdered and found in a ditch i'm more valued than diamonds more treasured than gold use me just one time and you too will be sold i'll make a school boy forget his bricks i'll make a beauty queen forget her looks i'll take a renowned speaker and make him a poor i'll take your mother and make a whore once i take charge you won't have a prayer now that you know me what will you do it's all up to you the day you agree to sit in my settle the decision is one that no one can straddle listen to me and listen to me well when you ride with cocaine you're headed for hell. Hmm. Yeah. So yeah, you know, not in shell, man. It's it's been a journey. We are all on our journeys. So I wrote a book. You know, I, I'm a writer through and through. Uh, I've got an organization called Warriors in Recovery. You know, it's amazing. I've partnered with some people. Actually, I partnered with Togozani, uh, Talks Media. Mm. You know, they run four or five uh, newsroom. We've done 15 episodes or so of uh, of a podcast. I'm doing a website. We're targeting to do 100,000 books. Yeah. I've already done 
Uh, I printed 2,000 last year and donated about 100 or so. May I've sold 1,800 books. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. From the back of, from the boot of my car. Your car, yeah. And my personal target is 10,000 sure. of my book. Okay. So I've got a book that I'm brewing called Hard Lessons. And I've got another book of, uh, of a true story of a captain from, from Guatemala in the 60s, mm. you know. And, uh, and I leave it at that. It's riveting stuff. This is, this is Hollywood stuff, blockbuster stuff. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I just well, want to. You're from UCLA. And and so I, I want to I, I wanna say to anybody listening, don't ever underestimate the power of your journey and the power of your testimony and where you come from and, um, and the challenges that you have to overcome. You know, technical stuff we can Google. But I'm moved by stories of people, how they overcome mm. and how they move from wrecks to riches and how they carve a niche for, for themselves. I'm moved by that. And most of us don't tell our stories because we are afraid or we are shy or we don't want to disclose. I'm not defined by what I went through. No, you can look at me and judge me all you want. I can tell you now when you put a full stop on my life, God comes and puts a comma and says the story continues. So I'm on my lane. <clears throat> Be on your lane. You've got a lot to, uh, to impact this generation. And this guy here, witness from where he comes from, I'm proud of him. I'm glad that he's in my circle. And uh, keep dreaming, keep hoping, uh, keep moving, keep fighting, and you will win. Thank you. If you can't walk, you must do it. Must crawl. If you can't walk, it's that, 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 you can't. It doesn't to do that, King. Yeah, if you can't fly, if you uh, if you can't walk, you must crawl or yeah. something like that. If you can't fly, run. Yeah, I don't if, know. I heard it from you. No, not from if, me. If you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. walk. If you can't walk, crawl. But whatever you do, keep, keep moving, moving yes, forward. That's right. Keep moving yeah, forward. And the last one I, 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 I heard from you oh. is is never forget where you come from. Uh, that's but France always France. always remember the bridges that's that Fra carried that's you That's France Fanon. Yeah. yeah, you see, but I you mean, taught me that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, I, polit I did political comparison in school. And I travel, I travel Nicaragua, El Salvador, Mexico, uh, Argentina. I mean, those areas I traveled. And it gives you a perspective about the struggle for emancipation for many people. Mm -hmm. And for me, uh, some of my political persuasions were shaped around that. You know, I met some of the best lecturers, you know, uh, the likes of Mazizi Kunene, Professor Mazizi Kunene, who passed away. Uh, uh, her husband, Matabo Kunene, is keeping a legacy. You know, Paul Freire, who wrote The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, so you read Antonio Gramsci, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, uh, you know, talking about uh, uh, counter uh, uh, hegemonic forces and, and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, so you read a lot and you get these things. And and yeah, and, and that's me. And uh, yeah, but but man, you know, and always look and strive to get a couple of streams of income. Don't depend on one. We live in an age where retirement is no longer guaranteed. Mm. You know, you've got to shape a life and shape it for yourself and, and look at where where you can go. So mm. now I have to go to my plantation. Sure. You know. Uh, and, I, I know uh, how busy you are. Uh, I'm not busy. <laughs> man. I just have to... I have to go to the office. So thank you so much no, for making you. time. Thank you. Uh, thank for you, the interview. Brother. Thank you. I thank appreciate you. it. No, thank you. And, thank you. And I love you so much. No, I love you more. I love, I love you, you so much. More. I've seen you grow, man. Yeah. Stay clear from... Uh, uh, yeah. You know. No longer a prisoner of the past. Sure. But a pioneer of the future. Mm. So pioneer a new future, bro. There's yeah. more in the future than there is in the past. Thank you so much. Guys, comment. I think you heard me twice. <laughs> <laughs> I heard you three times. Three times. Yeah. You know, you speak once, I hear you three yeah, times. Yeah, exactly. Not even exactly. twice. Exactly. So if you haven't subscribed, click on the subscribe button. Click on the notifications bell. Yo, let us know what part of the story you resonate with. You know, this story is so multifaceted. You know, it touches on different uh, places.
you know, different countries, different industries, and, and more specifically, the fact that you can draw inspiration from it and, and use it to empower. Mm. Don't you like that word? Yeah, empower. Empower your life. Mm. All right. For me and my team, it's more than like just it. money. Until next time. Ciao, guys. We're happy, ne? Mr. Produce. Hi. Hi, bro. No, no, no. You still here working?